Let's look a little bit at this Phoenician civilization. Remember, this was the hot spot for the, these Nephilim and these giants. In Lebanon today, they have, they have some archaeology that if you went there, your jaw would drop. They have a place called Baalbek where they have a, a, a marble or a, a, a stone that was made by man so big that they could not make that today because there were giants in the land. They've got archaeology there. The doors are so tall, and you wonder, why do they make doors this tall? Duh. The giants are from there. Well, called Phoenicians, meaning <laughs> distressed by the Greeks, the, the Phoenicians referred to themselves as Sidonians. Why do you think they called themselves Sidonians? It's because Sidonians, the, the city of Sidon, Tyre and Sidon, those two cities, this is right in the land of ancient Phoenicia. Heavily occultic, heavily uh, influenced by the giants. And notice that the, the meaning of Phoenicians is distressed by the Greeks. So you wonder how they got along. Now their capital city was named after Sidon. Sidon was the firstborn of Canaan, the son of Ham. This goes all the way back to Noah. Right after the, the, the sons of Ham came in. And remember, Canaan was cursed, right? Remember? Sidon was the son of Canaan. So he was, this is a very group of influ influential people. Ham was one of the original occupants of Noah's Ark, and he was Noah's youngest son. Remember, it was Ham who uncovered Noah's nakedness. Mm -hmm. Now, you've heard of Jezebel. I want you to get this connection tonight because you'll understand a lot if you'll just understand where this is coming from. A lot of people think, well, she was just evil. She was more than just evil. She was wrapped up in her Babylonian Phoenician religion worshiping Baal. They believed in Baal as much as we believe in Yeshua the Messiah. And this religion of theirs was captivating the entire area. Look what it says here in 1 Kings about Ahab and Jezebel. It came about that he, Ahab, married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians. See, a lot of times you don't see that when you're studying it. You just read it so fast you don't even think about it. But who was she? She was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians. So she was from this land, the city of Sidon in Phoenicia where they were worshiping Baal, and they were worshiping all the things that came down from Nimrod, who was a rebel against our God, Yahweh. And he, Ethbaal, went to serve Baal and worshiped him. So he erected an altar to, for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Now where is Samaria? Northern Israel. Remember, the children of Israel had all kinds of problems worshiping false gods, didn't they? Now you're seeing it kind of from the other direction, how it all came about, because the devil brought his people right to them, and they accepted them. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Then he goes into the Asherah poles and other occultic things. So the Sidonians were considered masters of science and magic. Now, you have to understand something, what the Watchers did. It talks about in the book of Enoch. When the Watchers came down, they not only procreated with human women. It tells you in the book of Enoch, they also gave many uh, in helpful insights on how to do things to the people that were there, uh, things like uh, mining and oaring, and how to get into witchcraft, and how to conjure demonic spirits, and how to do all those things that they shouldn't be doing, the watchers showed them to mankind. This is where much of your Babylonian mystery religion comes from, because they still venerate these things that they were taught by these demonic fallen angels. That's what the Babylonian mystery religions are all about. It'll make the hair on your you back your neck stand up when you read the, some of the stuff they're into. How do you think it says Nimrod, for example? Nimrod, it says, became a giborim or a giant. He became a giant. 
Now, this might freak you out a little bit, but in witchcraft today, you've, you've, you know that uh, there's, you've heard of witches riding brooms? Well, that's kind of getting into soul travel. They, they do that in, the, in, the, in a demonic spirit, uh, changing themselves into animals. That's why black cats running in front of your car are supposed to be bad luck. Well, they want to get you into bad luck and, and superstitions, but changing themselves into animals, they do that in voodoo. That stuff goes all the way back to the Sidonians, the Phoenicians, the ancient mystery religions. It's all there, and it's all amongst us even right now. That is why a lot of us are, are we, we go to a synagogue on Saturday on Shabbat, or we go to church on Sunday, and we let our kids watch all this demonic cartoon stuff that goes all the way back to this stuff. It's all around us, folks. The, Phoenici the Sidonians claimed to possess a civilization existing for 30,000 years. Well, it was ancient, but the, the earth is only 7,000 years old today. Ancient historians venerated the Sidonians. Sidonian navigators were especially sought by the Egyptians, Babylonians, Persians, and the Greeks. They were the original seafarers. They were the greatest at taking uh, ships to sea and taking things to other ports. That was what the Phoenicians were all about. The Greek alphabet was transferred directly from the Phoenician Sidonian script. Remember, there was one language, right? And we believe it's Hebrew, amen? But it was also Phoenician. You look at the Phoenician alphabet, it's the same thing. Before the language, the Hebrew language was changed when they were in exile, they changed the script of the letters. Before, it was of the same script as the Phoenician language. It applied to the sounds of the language of the Greeks, hence the meaning of the word is where we get the word phonetic. So this is Sidon here, and this is Phoenicia, and this is Israel down here. But all along here, this is where they would travel to, and there were seafarers all, the, all over the place. This is the ancient language in the Phoenician. This is, they used to look at Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet. It's the same as we know in Hebrew today. But it was the same. This is the one language that was before uh, everybody in the world. It's called the Paleo Hebrew script. It's the exact same thing as the Phoenician script. It's the same language. There was once, it's hard for us to conceive of it, isn't it? But there was one language in the whole world, and this was their alphabet. And it was Hebrew, yeah, but it was also Phoenician. And from that ancient language came all the other languages. And this is Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea. This is Phoenicia over here. This is Israel right here. Notice how close they are. And this is ancient. Of course, they were great seafarers. They were noted for it. Here, the yellow, you see, this is Phoenician influence. The blue is Greek influence. Notice that these two, the Greeks and the Phoenicians, control the entire Mediterranean area. And, the, and everything for, for centuries, they were the ones that ruled everything. And then God brought the children of Israel into, the, into play through Abraham, okay? This is the significance now of Mount Hermon. We're going to see how now the battle is enjoined by the Lord between God and the God of Mount Hermon. When you study God's word, you can sometimes notice that it seems simply like one continuous narrative going on and on and on, but there's a lot happening. We just don't know a lot of it because we're, not, we're unfamiliar with the history around it. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, continually surfaces in the stories in the Gospels and likewise. The stories in the Gospels are foretold and prophesied throughout the Tanakh. One amazing example of this is found in the similarities between Moses' trip up Mount Sinai in Exodus 24. We're very familiar with that, aren't we? And Yeshua's experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was Mount Hermon in Matthew 17. Now, understand what was going on when Yeshua took the disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, which is at the foot of Mount Hermon. He took them up to Mount Hermon. What this was in the spiritual realm, 
this was a in your face to the devil because the devil claims Mount Hermon as his home ground. And it was and in Matthew 17, go back now and look at it real close because in Matthew 17 you have the exchange between Yeshua and Peter. And, and Yeshua asked them on Mount Hermon before they go to the top, who do men say that I am? Remember that? And they said, well, some think you're Ezekiel, some think you're John the Baptist, and they, they said, you know, Isaiah, and, he's, and, and so on and so forth. And they turned to Peter, and he said, but yeah, but who do you say that I am? And he said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And that declaration right there on Mount Hermon was an in-your-face to the devil. And also on the side of Mount Hermon, there was a, there's this... There was this place, uh, it's, a, it's a grotto, and in this grotto, it's, there's a chasm in there, and it's known as the house of, or the, um, the gates of Hades. And this is where Yeshua said, and this is right there on Mount Hermon, right there at Caesarea Philippi, right at the base of Mount Hermon, looking right at the uh, gates of hell, and Yeshua said, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. He was, he was taking away everything. He was, he was almost spiritually disemboweling Satan when, in Matthew 17. And it's not, it's not random. And he did it right at Satan, what Satan would consider to be his stronghold, Mount Hermon. That's what's going on there. And remember in Mount Sinai, this is when the people approached God on Mount Sinai and were given the law and the Ten Commandments, right? This, it's very similar what happened on Mount Hermon, but in the opposite direction. Uh, it, it was approximately 1,500 years. In both stories, the main characters go up on a high mountain with God. Remember, they go up on the high mountain with God. Yeshua is the Son of God. He is God on earth. In both stories, three men go with the main character. Moses took Joshua, Aaron, and Hur, right? And Yeshua took Peter, James, and John. In both cases, a cloud covered the mountain. In Exodus 24, it says, For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses. In both Matthew and Mark, the gospel writers are careful to tell us that it was six days that Yeshua took the disciples upon the mountain. Amazing parallel there. In both stories, nothing happened for six days. And then on the seventh day, God spoke. In both stories, God spoke from the cloud. Remember, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter pipes up and he says, shouldn't we build, you, build three tabernacles here? And God spoke from the cloud, telling him in his own way to be quiet. <laughs> he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. From the cloud. So this is Mount Hermon. In both stories, God's glory appeared and changed or transfigured the appearance of the principal figures as they were spoken to by God. Remember, Moses came down from the mountain. He was white as snow. And remember, Yeshua was transfigured, white as snow, on the mountain. It says the glory of God settled on both mountains. And that's on Mount Hermon. This is when Yeshua went there in Matthew 17. You see, the devil claims glory for himself at Mount Hermon with all the occultic rites and all the occultic rituals, but it's going to be coming to an end. And then at Mount Sinai, God met men there. What's going on here? I wonder what's happening here. Oops. 
it just frozen a little bit here. There we go. Ah. Uh, oh no. Momentito. Wow, it completely left me. Discuss amongst yourselves for a second here. <laughs> Can you pause that, Roseanne? Okay. All right. Keep it on. For some reason, the thing just zapped out on me. Okay, sorry about that. Yes. Um, well, it's Mount Hermon is right to the north of the Sea of Galilee, about 50 miles. So you've got, I don't, I, I'm saying maybe like six, seven, eight hundred miles somewhere, something like that between them. Now, so we've got all this light happening. In fact, Remember I told you about the tribe of Dan. They were down here, and they moved north because they wanted to be near all the occultic activity up here in Phoenicia, in Mount Hermon. But remember in the tabernacle area, the Hebrew word for settle is shekan, and means to settle temporarily or to tent, or abide in a temporary dwelling, like a tent. In Hebrew, the word mishkan is a derivative of shekan, which is how we say tent or tabernacle. So it's possible that Peter realized that Yeshua was reconstruct. Was it possible that he was reconstructing Moses' story? Was it thinking, what can we do to bring Shekhan like the Moses story? So he says, let's build something temporary. Let's put up some tents to duplicate the Sinai experience. No, 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 no. That's not what God wanted at all. God was up there to draw his foot in the sand in the warfare against the devil. Shekhan is also where we get the word Shekinah to mean God's glory or the divine presence. Peter wasn't just trying to think of something to do. He knew the story of Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. Luke adds a wonderful exclamation point in his account of the transfiguration. It says in Luke 9, they spoke of his departure. From Mount Hermon, from this time on, Yeshua left Mount Hermon, and he came down to Jerusalem, and that's where he went to the crucifixion from there. So this is a very important time. The Greek word for departure is exodus, which when, and when exodus is used in the New Covenant, it's almost always used in conjunction with the actual exodus story. So we see a lot of parallels between Mount Hermon and Mount Sinai. The use of this Greek word wonderfully links Yeshua's death and resurrection with God rescuing his people out of Egypt. Because remember, he went from Mount Hermon to Jerusalem to die for our sins. Further proof that Yeshua was fulfilling his role as the second Moses is found in Deuteronomy 18, where the Lord tells Moses that he will raise up another prophet that will be like me, and then he says, listen to him. That happened at Mount Hermon. These are the exact same words that God used at the transfigurations. This is my son. Listen to him. This comparison of Mount Sinai with Mount Hermon gives us an interesting link between what happened in Genesis 6 with the watchers coming down and the coming days of Noah pronounced in Matthew 24. Remember, it says that it, how will it be in the last days? It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. And these giants were prevalent in Phoenicia. These giants were famous in Phoenicia. These giants got all the glory in this part of the world. In Baal worship, they were a big deal. You know, they're a big deal today. You talk about all the, the word Titan. 
You know what the word Titan means? The word Titan is one of the words for the uh, tribe of Nephilim, the Titans, before the flood. All this, all this belief system goes back to Mount, si Mount Hermon. Hermon means forbidden place. That's what the name Hermon means, forbidden place. Mount Hermon, named after Hermes, was a portal of entry where the watcher class of fallen angels descended to earth in the book of Enoch. They swear upon the, that mountain that they would, not, they would take wives among the daughters of men and corrupted mankind. That's where it's from. And it's mentioned in Genesis 6. It's the gate of the fallen angels. Now, so you see it's, it's sitting up there, and it's a forbidden place spiritually. And, you, you know, God's not getting angry if you travel up there. No, it's, that's not the point. This is the enemy place. This is the spiritual place of the enemies of God. Jerome, the 4th century translator of the Latin Vulgate Bible, interpreted Hermon as anathema. That's where we get the word anathema from. From Mount Hermon. Genesis 6, Moses wrote, The sons of God, that's the Nephilim, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So you go back to the mythology of that area, Greek mythology, Achilles, uh, Atlas, Hercules, all these are names of the Nephilim, the fallen ones, the giants of renown. That's where it all comes from. In the Zohar, which is the occultic book in Judaism, the book of splendor it's called, they get into these things, into the, into the rituals in the Kabbalah. You've heard of Kabbalah. This is where Kabbalah comes from. It's not Jewish. It's not biblical. It's of the occult. It's of the devil. The Kabbalah is so deceptive to people, especially in Judaism, but a lot of people are trapped in this world of, of deception. Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, is not scripture at all. They'll, they'll pervert. You'll say, well, they use this verse here, and they use this verse there. They use it wrongly, and they use it in a perverted way. Concerning the Nephilim, there is a rabbinical remark about this story in an ancient Jewish commentary, the Zohar, in which two rabbis add the following insight. I just want to show you how they work it. Rabbi Jose says, Following a tradition that these Nephilim were Uzzah and Azazel, whom God deprived of their supernal sanctity, how it may be asked, can they exist in this world? Rabbi Haya answers that they were of a class of spirits referred to in the words, and birds which they fly on the earth. And these, as we have said, appear to men in the form of human beings. So they're looking at the Nephilim and they're saying, yeah, they're like birds. And a lot of the symbolism that you see around the world of birds as men goes right back to these beliefs of, of the, uh, the Nephilim and so forth. It is asked, how can they transform themselves? <laughs> The answer is that they do, in fact, transform themselves into all kinds of shapes because when they come down from heaven, they become as concrete as air and take human shape. So they're talking about these demonic entities taken on human form and oftentimes looking like birds. A lot of times you see pictures of angels with wings and so forth, right? You say, well, where did we get that idea from? It wasn't from the Bible. See the wings. In the ancient paintings. These are Uzzah and Azazel who rebelled in heaven and were cast down by God and became corporeal or bodily on the earth and remained on it, not being able to divest themselves of their earthly form. Subsequently, they went astray after women. <clears throat> and up to this day, they exist and teach men the arts of magic. This is where mankind learned of the things of magic. Remember in the Bible when Moses went into Pharaoh and God said, just throw your staff down and it'll become a snake, right? What did Pharaoh's men do? Oh, no big deal. They threw theirs down. 
except Moses' snake ate theirs. But they were operating in witchcraft, and it was working to a point. They begat children whom they called Anakim. That means giants. While the Nephilim themselves were called sons of God. Nephilim literally means the fallen ones. And you see the birds, the phoenix, like the, word, the eagle, the phoenix, the wings. You see, the, you see how, they, how they want themselves to understand that they are the ones that are rising from the, uh, from the ashes, right? Remember that one rabbi alluded to a class of spirits described as birds in Genesis 1. And it gets back to this idea of the phoenix. This is what they want their own people to think. We're going to rise up. Just like the, the Nephilim. Remember that God declared war on the Nephilim. God is the one that, in the book of Enoch, the, Neph, the Nephilim, the watchers, go to Enoch. And they say, go plead with God for us. And God tells Enoch, go back to them and tell them, no, they're judged, they're dead, they're doomed, and they're going to watch their offspring die. And it's precisely what happened. But they think that they're going to make a comeback. Perhaps this was the origin of the story that angels had bird-like wings. To this day, white doves are symbolic of good, while black crows are symbol or typical of evil, aren't they? We know that typology even today. It should also be noted that birds seem to have a reptilian connection. Like the phoenix was depicted as an eagle in the west, but in the east, it's a winged dragon. Think about uh, Chinese mythology and Indian mythology. They have great winged dragons and serpents and so forth. But in the West, it, it's the eagle. From ancient lore, Satan was thought to be somewhat of a gargoyle with bat-like wings. If you want to see how uh, in power this religion is in our culture today, see, they, they do things underneath the surface. And they're Go downtown to any major build, town in any building in the country. Look at all the main structures, the main uh, skyscrapers, and look at all the gargoyles that are all over the place. Everywhere you go, every city, every major city with their skyscrapers, you see it's all over the place. That is why the, the buildings themselves, the, the height of the building has to do with their belief system. Giants in the land. And so the book of Enoch is very important. I, I do a teaching on the book of Enoch, which I'll do again in the near future. But I believe God has raised up this book of Enoch for the last days. It says in the first chapter of the book of Enoch that these writings are, are not meant for the, your days, Enoch. They are meant for the generation at the end of time to understand. And I believe that's exactly what we have on hand with the book of Enoch now. You read the book of Enoch, it'll bring you right in line with this warfare. It'll show you exactly what it's all about. I don't know how you understand Bible prophecy if you don't understand what happened in the book of Enoch. If you don't have an idea of the watchers and the Nephilim and understand what was going on there in Mount Hermon and in Phoenicia, if you don't know all of that what's going on, you will really have no real clue of what's happening in so much of the Bible prophecy because this is a war between God and and Lucifer, and these are Lucifer's people. The symbolism of the phoenix or eagle, the snake, the serpent, it all goes back into Luciferianism, which is the belief that Lucifer is God. That's what they believe. They say, yeah, we believe the Bible, but their slant on the Bible is completely different than ours. They believe our God's the bad God that entrapped Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And that, that Satan was there, the snake was there, in order to free them. And that God was whole, I mean, it's completely warped, flip-flopped from what we think today. But they still believe that in Freemasonry and in the occult and the Babylonian mystery religions today. You'd be, you'd be amazed how many people believe that nonsense. The following is quoted from the book of Enoch. And it came to pass, after the children of men had increased in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. 
And the angels, the sons of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said one to another, Behold, we will choose for ourselves wives from among the children of men, and will beget our, our, for ourselves children. They plotted while still in the heavens to come down and do this. It's an amazing thing. A lot of people think, well, angels can't sin. They have a free will, and they did. And they descended on Ardis, which is the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn on it and bound themselves mutually by a curse. They came together and they bonded together, and it was a curse. And this is the book of Enoch. It's the Nephilim story where the angels became corrupt, and God, and they, it changed the earth. It, remember, it talks about in the book of Genesis, during the days of Jared, and in the, before the flood, this is like the sixth or seventh generation from Adam, that when this happened, it changed the course of earth. And it, this is what brought on the flood of Noah. Of all places on this planet where angels could have descended, it was on the northern border of the promised land. Now you, know, now you can see why God was, was sending Abraham into the area. He was going to do battle against all of this. And again, here's Mount Hermon. 33.33 north, 33.33 east. Goes all the way back to the rebellion at Babylon. And mankind is still in rebellion against the Lord, our creator. Still. Perhaps knowing something about God's future plans to give territory to Abraham's descendants, these angels plotted their strategy to introduce the seed of the serpent into the human race. You can tell what God was doing. He was taking his best choices servant, Abraham, and sending him from Ur the Chaldees all the way into the land of Canaan to do battle on his terms. And notice he chose the weakest, humblest, oldest people you can imagine to come in there and do the job. Remember, your faith can, can move mountains. That's all the, that's all the armor we need. Also, Mount Hermon lay in the territory where Ham and his family migrated after God's judgment at the Tower of Babel. So here's the contested area. This is the land of Canaan. Canaan, again, the son of Ham, right? And this is the, notice, this is the land of Shem. This is where Abraham's from. This is where you get the term anti-Semitic, by the way. Semitic comes from Shem. And Abraham was Semitic. There's a, actually, there's a lot of other Semitic people, but this is where it comes from, but, because over here they're anti-Semitic. So, but this is the contested area. But here's the land of Japheth, and here's the land of Ham, and here's the land of Shem. According to Genesis 10.6, Ham had four sons, and the sons of Ham were Cush, and Mizraim, and Put, and Canaan. Now, every one of these had their area. This is the land, this is, Mizraim is, is Egypt in the Egyptian language, Mizraim. Put is over here near Libya, and Cush is down here in Ethiopia. Those are three names of sons of Ham. And then Canaan is the other son right here. Canaan was the one that was cursed. Canaan settled in the area of Mount Hermon and southward into the territory. That was to become Abraham's promised land. You can see the fight coming, can't you? Just what we see today in the battle in the Middle East with the Palestinians, and all, none of that's new. The spiritual warfare precedes the physical warfare. And in that land, it will be contested until Yeshua comes back and destroys his enemies. So understand that that area has been battled over and battled over and still battled over. This is why the promised land was called Canaan in the days of Moses and Joshua. Now Mizraim continued to move southward into Egypt. Coincidentally, Mount Hermon has three peaks, and Ham's family encountered another set of three peaks, three mountain peaks, right, that had been built before the flood, those being the three great pyramids. You see the three peaks on Mount Hermon? A lot of people think that the three peaks of the pyramid are there to uh, rejoice over that. The, 
Those three pyramids, yes, those three pyramids. That's their thought. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's what they, that's in their folklore. Evidently, Mizraim was fascinated by the pyramids and developed a system of worship based on those ancient structures. Cush and Put continued the family migration southward and settled in Ethiopia and parts of South Southern Africa. So this, this affects greatly, this spiritual warfare affects greatly human history, doesn't it? You can see how it all meshed out. And it goes down to Lebanon, Beirut, all of this, this real hotbed right now of spiritual warfare. This is ancient Phoenicia. Mount Hermon's right here. All of this is ready to blow up today. <laughs> it's all, it all, everything I'm telling you goes back to that. Then you have the Golan Heights. This is another hot area. All this area was once so settled in the occult. God sent his people in there, sent Yeshua in there, and this fight has been going on ever since. To this day, Mount Hermon is still the place where evil continually rains down upon Israel. Think about it, the wars. It is the area of the Syrians and Hezbollah. The book of Enoch continues. And they took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go into them and mixed with them and taught them charms and conjurations, and made them acquainted with the cutting of roots and of woods. All those things were taught to mankind by the watchers. And we think, well, that's, some of that's good. You, any of it can be used for good, but most, many of it's used for evil, and it's also used in witchcraft. And they became pregnant and brought forth great giants whose stature was 3,000 L's. That's like, we think in... You know, we think Wilt Chamberlain or, Sha or Shaquille O'Neal's a giant, right? Somebody that's seven foot three. To me, he is <laughs> huge, right? And after the flood, uh, Goliath was, they say, like 13 feet tall. That's a giant. Or, and Og and uh, uh, the giant, the king giants that Moses fought, Og and Bashan, they were like uh, 13, 15, 18 feet, they, you know. But before the flood, the giants were like a hundred stories tall. That's what a thousand L's is. That's, that's, that's the size of a skyscraper. That's how big they were. And they about destroyed all of humankind. They were destroying all the animals. The whole earth was crying out for deliverance when the flood came. And only eight humans made it out. That's how close to distinction mankind was. These devoured all the acquisitions of mankind till men were unable to sustain themselves, and the giants turned themselves against mankind in order to devour them. You know, that's, uh, we talk in terms of cannibalism. Yeah, there were, there, cannibalism became very prevalent during this day. That is why one of the reasons we know it's the last times now is because cannibalism is on the rise again in the world. It seems that these fallen angels, the Nephilim, contaminated almost all life on earth. Now you have the context of Noah and his family and God coming to him saying, this is going to end. We do not know how many people were contaminated, but we are told that at least Noah's family remained genetically pure. That's what you want to keep in mind. It's not that Noah was a great righteous man. No, but he was still a human being. He still had the DNA of a human being and his family, everybody else was corrupted or about to be corrupted or whatever, but Moses' family was genetically pure still. You see, the Messiah had to come from a human being. That's the point. So as it was in the days of Noah, for that reason God destroyed the world with a flood. Had it not been for Noah and his three sons, those fallen angels might have brought an end to all life on the planet. They were on their way to doing just that. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth helped save the animals and repopulate the earth. And we know the story. But these spiritual enemies of God were still around. They were, they were destroyed in the flood, but the spirits of the Nephilim, that is who the demons are today. And God judged the angels. But, 
you're getting into uh, areas I'm not, I, I can speculate. There's, there's, say, or Lucifer is a great archangel. You're getting into authority structures and things that God has said that has put into place that he adheres to his own word. So we don't fully understand it, but we know that the devil is on a short leash. But here's a, you wonder how, how big this religion is around us. This is the logo for Paramount Pictures. Notice, count the stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one stars that you see. This is the three peaks of Mount Hermon. Very clear right here. This is go the whole industry of Hollywood is into this stuff. It's symbolically into all of our movies. It's all over the place. Notice that Jesus can very rarely get any good uh, publicity on TV. That's because the devil is the prince of the power of the air. He owns the systems of the world till Yeshua comes back. Both Peter and Jude added further insight about these fallen angels. And it's important that you see this. Peter said, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So Peter laid it out, just exactly what happened. And then Jude said, Jude put it this way, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So Jude reiterated. Both passages tell of the severe punishment upon the watchers and children, the Nephilim. Yet Moses said that sons of God reappeared after the flood. You ask yourself, well, how did that happen? Well, you, you still have spiritual entities that make themselves known to man even today. Why do you think that, they, that witches have covens and they have seances and so forth? Because they're conjuring up demonic spirits. They're still getting their information from the spiritual realm. The physical entities all died. But spiritually, Nimrod appealed to them and he became who he became. How could the Nephilim reappear after the flood of Noah? It says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. And when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. But after the flood, there was a comeback of the Nephilim. And this, this, now you know why when God told Joshua, I want you to go in, I want you to destroy the men the women, the children, the animals, everything, wipe them out. It's because many of these were Nephilim, had become Nephilim. Keep in mind the book of Enoch only mentioned 200 angels descending among Hermon, and Satan was not among them. So Satan's still alive and he's still doing his thing. This is real spiritual warfare. And you and I are involved in this even today. Now, we don't realize most of the time how much power we have over the devil. The devil works very hard to get us to think that we're weak and we're useless and we don't have nothing going for us. Fact is, I, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will show all of us the authority we truly have in the Spirit because we have it. The devil knows it and he's afraid of us or he's afraid of what the Holy Spirit can do through us. Of course, Satan's forces were much larger than a mere 200, weren't they? Perhaps the original group of Nephilim were scouts for a much larger force of demonic angels who, under the leadership of Satan, came to earth after the flood. It goes back, to, remember, the Tower of Babel, which was totally demonic, was after the flood, about three generations after the flood. It seems the Tower of Babel, which means gate to God, may have been built in an effort to contact these dark forces and forge a defense against the threat of another judgment from Yahweh. I've, I've heard of red, and it's in ancient writings. They say they wanted, they wanted it to build it so tall that no flood could destroy it. Re 
Remember what was stated in the Zohar. Rabbi Haya said, to this day they exist and teach men the arts of magic. Listen, every one of your Babylonian religious things, it's all about magic. Any supernatural, mystical power outside the Holy Spirit is magic and it's rebellion against God. It's all wrong. As noted above, Genesis 6, 4 adds, after that, and after that, meaning that more Nephilim were returned to this area after the flood and established what Joshua called the land of giants. Remember the children of Israel that came into the land, and they said, we can't take this land. They're full of giants. This is what was going on. And this is some of the pictures of some of the archaeology that's coming about these days. Bones of giants. Yeah, this is from Numbers 13:33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, or get Anakim, which come of the giants, and we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Yeah, this is what this is what a normal man would look like over here. This is 12 feet tall, 16, 24 foot tall. 30 foot tall, 36 foot tall. Yeah. Nice basketball team, but yeah. Moses and Joshua conquered those giants of whom Og was king. When you study Joshua and Caleb, when Caleb went into the promised land, the ones he defeated when he came into the promised land were the giants. He went right after them. He understood his authority. Moses wrote that Og's bed was almost 15 feet long. This is one of the ancient uh, 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 wall carvings. Look at this is Og or Bashan, the, the giant king, and he's mess. He's these are his people that he's killing, or, or defeating in battle, whatever. But notice that he's a giant, and he's depicted that way. Og reigned in Mount Hermon. That was his home base. In Joshua 12, it says, The other king was Og, king of Bashan, and his territory, who was of the remnant of the giants who dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edri, and reigned over Mount Hermon, over Salka, over all Bashan, as far as the border of the Gezurites and the Makathites, and over half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Sihon was his brother. I've been misstating that the whole night. But Sihon and Og, they were giants, kings. So that gives you an idea of the, I want to show you the occultic background around Mount Hermon. This is where Baal worships from. The Tower of Babel was all about the same belief system. The Phoenicians were completely engulfed in this, and they spread their influence around the world. Yeshua, when he said, it'll be like it was in the days of Noah, we're seeing what is in their minds, the uptick, the uprising of this phoenix bird coming back to power, the eagle. That is why we see so much of the garbage that we see in our culture, because the people that believe in that system think that this is their day. That's one of the reasons that as a believer in Yeshua, you're their main target. You're really their only target. But it's all about that ark, about us making it into the ark. Amen? And them that endure to the end will be saved. That's what the scripture says, and that's what we believe, and we walk in this. So we, we are to not be deceived. The only way that you cannot be deceived is to come out from among them and be separate. You can't be part of that, and it, now that you know what you know, you can't be a part of that and, and, under, and have any understanding because so many people have gone into compromise, and that compromise has taken everything away from their spiritual walk. So we have to be guarded, don't we? As it was in the days of Noah, a flood is coming, and we see the flood that has been planned for thousands of years, starting on Mount Hermon. Now, next week when we study the tribe of Dan, you're going to see the same things coming upon the body of Messiah. From Mount Hermon, we, we talked tonight, the tribe of Dan is 
just as steeply involved in the occult, and it's very much out there in the world we live in today as well. So we want to do an expose on that. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in Yeshua's name, we pray right now, Lord, that you would give us your light. And Lord, we pray that you would take all the darkness away. Father, forgive us for being deceived by any of these spirits that are out there. And help us, Lord, to be sober and to be vigilant. Because we know our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Open our eyes and open our hearts, Lord, that we can walk with you all the days of our life. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen.